for some reason I saw on some logs up in the back of a pickup many years ago in my 20s, early 20s. And apparently from what happened, I didn't need a chainsaw in my hand at the time. But I tell people nowadays, if you're going to need to use a chainsaw, you need to treat it like a rattlesnake. Act like it is a rattlesnake and it wants to bite because it's about the only safe way to handle. You handle them away from your body. But I, I somehow come and got in a situation where chainsaw came down and cut a crease in my Levi's that were against my leg. And thank God, that's all it did. But those, those instruments are made to grab whatever they're cutting in. Grab it. Get more of it. And so there are absolutes in the scriptures where the Lord wants us to understand and know some things. For instance, one is, is uh, Jesus said, if you believe not that I am he, I am the Messiah, I am the God of the universe come in flesh, you shall die in your sins. If you believe not, I am divine. I am of God. I am emanating out of God. Then you'll die in your sins. Because if you don't believe, you won't be praying to him. You won't be repenting to him. You won't be seeking his way and his will. If, if you don't have a belief in him, he's the only way into heaven. We live in a world of a lot of ecumenicism in it, and the ecumenical movement has affected a lot of even people in Christianity, where they're willing to let other people, I mean, you can't keep people from believing what they want to believe, but they're willing to say, well, they're, they were raised Christians, but they're, they'll make a statement like, uh, they're searching after the light in their own way, and, and we want them to find it, like there's another way. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Jesus said, I am the door. No man gets to God except by me. So those are absolute things. And we want to be kind to everybody. We want to uh, love everybody, no matter what they believe. We love them for who God made them. He died for them. He wants to save them. They would make great Christians, Bible-believing Christians that walk in the Spirit if they would follow after Jesus Christ. So because they disagree with us has nothing to do with how we treat them. We need to love them, be kind to them, be as peaceable with them as is possible. And so it's important for us to understand these absolutes that are in the scriptures. Another absolute, John 3, 5 says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Jesus speaking, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. And that's why we emphasize being baptized. Jesus also said, except a man repent, except he repent. There's no salvation without repentance. There's no cleansing without repentance. If they won't repent, they sh they'll perish. Now, that's, those are some harsh absolutes. Uh, and when we're trying to win people, we don't win them quoting those scriptures to them. Wise as serpents, but harmless as doves. But they're there just as the same. But we gently work with people and help them understand that uh, there is a way to God. And it'll be through Jesus Christ. And we don't compromise on that, but neither do we compromise on having a bad spirit. We don't want a bad spirit. We want to love people, be kind to them. Uh, and endeavor to influence them to the Lord Jesus Christ. Another absolute of the Bible is God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. 
it's not a matter of uh, just a, a worship that doesn't uh, come from a sincere heart. That is required to enter into his presence and to worship him in spirit and in truth. That S in that scripture talking about your human spirit. In other words, you get into your worship. We're all different personalities. Some are going to get into it very loud. Others can do it quietly. But the important thing is that we do it in spirit, that we engage ourselves into it, and we refuse to just go through the motions. I've come to church tired like you have, and uh, I was the preacher. Uh, but that didn't matter how I'm going to worship. And I endeavor to do it. I'm older now. I don't have the energy that I used to have. And sometimes I come to church without any energy. But by the grace of God, I'm going to be clapping my hands. I'm going to be raising my hands. I'm going to be lifting my voice. I'm going to get with spirit. We all knew what school spirit was in high school. Those cheerleaders and the different people, the different ball teams would try to rev up the human spirit that was in the school just to get them excited about what's going on. Well, we can engage ourselves in those areas if that's what we choose to do. But um, I'm going to make sure when I'm in the house of God, I engage my spirit in worship to the Lord. Let's praise him a little bit right now. Come on, engage your spirit. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to your holy name. I worship you. I worship you. I worship you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And so it's a wonderful thing to worship him in spirit. And then, of course, the truth part means we're sincerely seeking to follow the Lord and to please him in all we do. Hebrews 12, 14 is another absolute. And there's a num numerous absolutes. We're certainly not going to try to even touch them all tonight. But Hebrews 12, 14 says, Follow peace with all men, with all men, with all men, excuse me, and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. And so here it is, this peaceableness, this non-judgmental attitude, we're to work with people in that manner and not judge them by first appearances or even tenth appearances, but to live peaceably with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. So here we have another absolute in holiness and what it is and what it means. And it's a wonderful thing to get a concept in our heart and to get an understanding of all of these uh, absolutes I've just mentioned and the others that are throughout the scriptures. Esau was one of the children of Isaac and Rebekah, and he was first born. He was twins with Jacob, was born just a few minutes before Jacob was. But Esau had the same opportunity that Jacob had in following after the things of God. Abraham, Sarah were people of faith. Isaac was a person of faith. And uh, they were raised in the home of, of Isaac and Rebekah. And they were people of faith. Those boys grew up around their parents. And they heard the stories of their grandfather Abraham and Sarah. They heard the story of their dad going to the mountaintop and, and uh, laying on that sacrifice, however it all happened, and how that God intervened and saved his life. They heard about the story of Enoch. They heard about Adam and Eve. Those stories that we know in the scripture were passed on from one to the other. And uh, the people that lived, and they were living so long in that first generation of people. Uh, there are just a few people removed from Adam to Isaac and to Esau and Jacob. But somehow Esau didn't listen 
with much desire in his heart. He heard the same stories. He heard the same teachings. He heard how God spoke to Abraham, his father, but he didn't desire to seek after God and find him for himself. He placed, uh, the Bible calls him a profane person, a person who was uh, irreligious and who was disrespectful of the things of God and who for one meal, for one morsel of meat, the Bible says, sold his birthright. That birthright was extremely important. It had responsibilities with it. The firstborn got the birthright, but he also had the responsibility to take care of his parents in their old age. And he had uh, extra blessings come his way because of it. And that was true of all people, but in the spiritual realm, in the people that followed after God, there were many blessings that came as a result of that birthright. But somehow, it didn't interest Esau. He, uh, he had other things on his mind. He came to church, and his mind went to Six Flags. <laughs> Or Carowinds. He, uh, he, he when, when his dad started telling the stories, he got his on his iPad. When things happen, he just got, just like we, we're tempted in our flesh, our flesh will take us down those roads right here tonight if we allow it. But uh, this is why our children, hopefully, are much better students. Anything they study. Why? Because when they come to the house of God, they've trained themselves to focus in on what's being said, to hear it, to bring our minds back when it wanders off a little bit, and to get the good out of the, the teaching that is being brought forth. And so Esau, uh, he, he placed no value on the blessings of God until it was too late. And uh, then he wanted it bad. Then it's kind of like when the rapture takes place. You all know what the rapture is. This is uh, when the Lord comes back, takes his church out of this world. The trump of God shall stand, sound. The dead in Christ shall rise first. We who are alive and remain shall be caught up together in the clouds, and we shall be forever with the Lord. Oh, happy day that's going to be. We're living in the end of time. The signs of the times are all around us. They've been more fulfilled now than ever before. There's nothing holding back except the mercy of God because revival is happening in China, in Russia, in places we've been held out of for years. On the continent of Africa, revival is happening. The only thing I can see that's holding back is God's mercy trying to reach more people with the gospel. And, uh, but the, re the day the rapture takes place, guess what? There's going to be a prayer meeting here that night. We've talked about it and looked at it. I'm not going to take long tonight. But uh, someone's going to get in this church. The problem, too, is probably someone's going to have a key to get in. But if they don't have a key, they're going to bring a hammer with them. They're going to get in this church. They're going to be in this altar. Why is that? Well, it wasn't important enough until, wow, it, it really did happen. The faith wasn't really there. Is it going to happen? Is it not going to happen? Do these people know? Is everybody guessing? It's going to happen. You can mark that down. And you want to be ready for it when it does happen. And so it's, it's important that we place value on the things of God while we can do something with them. But knowing uh, we, we went back, back in 1988, many of you will remember the book that came out, 88 Reasons Why the Lord's Coming in 1988. I read the book. It kind of stirred me up, even though I kind of try to stay stirred on that subject, because most of the points were right on, except where he put down a date. He said it's going to happen on a certain day, because the Bible's already canceled that one out. No man 
going to know the day or the hour. But Jesus said we need to know the season that it's going to happen. We need, and we're in the season right now of the coming of the Lord. And so if you want to do something for God, if you want to be ready to meet God, now's the time to be, get concerned about it. Don't wait till after it happens because all hell's going to be unleashed on this world for the last three and a half years of the time of tribulation. And there's no telling thousands, tens of thousands uh, from all we can read in the scripture, millions of people will lose their life as Satan destroys and moves in the hearts of people with hatred and animosity, and this world goes into a tragic situation. So now's the time to put value on the blessings of God. And Esau wanted the blessing after it had already been given away. For ye know how that afterward when he, he would have inherited the blessing, the Bible says, he found no place of repentance, so he sought it carefully with tears. He had bargained with Jacob, his younger brother, for the, for the birthright. He had sold it to him. Said, yeah, you can have it. I want something to eat. And he got his, he got his uh, dinner but he sold his birthright. And then he wanted it so bad, but it was already given away. So there was no way for him to get it back. So we've been called to a, a, a lifestyle of holiness because follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man can see the Lord. Ephesians 2, 3 says, among whom also we have had our conversation in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. It's important that we understand what that word, that Greek word, it was translated conversation, what that means. And we would think of it more as a our lifestyle, how we live our lives, our manner of living, how we conduct ourselves, what we think about, what we talk about, what we watch, what we read, what we do, and our whole manner of living that we are to make sure that our lifestyle is not the way we used to live our lives before Christ came into our life. Before he really became Lord of our life. Oh, happy day when he became Lord of our life. Hallelujah. And uh, the joy that comes with that. Uh, Ephesians 4.22, that she put off concerning the former conversation. The former way you used to live before you knew Christ. The old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. And how true this is. There's a new man. We used to sing that song, new man walking in my shoes. He don't do the things he used to do. Cussing, cheating, lying, fighting, carousing. What else? We could keep on going. Drunk every Friday night, looking for a fight. Coming for off a headache on Sunday. Whatever it was. The Lord, hallelujah. He doesn't leave us. He loves us too much to leave us how he finds us. He picks us up, gives us a hope of heaven, hallelujah. Brings us into the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Pastor Nathan said it recently, the word of God is the final authority. It has been and always will be the final authority. That's why... We all are called to be people who meditate daily in the Word of God, in the Scriptures, in the Bible, and learn what it says and let it speak to our hearts. 1 Timothy 4.12, let no man despise thy youth, young people, 
But be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. How can we do all of that? Well, by just walking in the spirit. If we walk in the spirit of God, we will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. If we walk in the spirit of man or woman, in the spirit of our flesh, we will fulfill the lust of the flesh. So it's not a difficult thing to understand. The Bible talks about being filled with the Holy Ghost and fire. A lot of times we think of that fire as the excitement that the Spirit brings into our life. A fire got stirred up tonight. But really, a true, I mean, we do have that aspect. But the true fire that's talked about with the Holy Ghost and fire in the scriptures is a fire that burns out those evil desires that we used to have, the lifestyle we used to live, the places we used to go, the things we used to read and watch. We get those burned out by the holiness of Almighty God. To the point that we can walk in holiness before the Lord, like the scripture teaches us to do. And so it's a beautiful thing to determine that we're going to walk with Jesus. 1 Peter 1.15, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. That's not just talking to somebody. That's how we use the word. But the Greek word is far broader than that. It is the whole process of how we live our lives and how we talk and how we think, what motivates us. And it's important for us to understand that uh, when we talk of holiness, there is an inner aspect of it and there's an outward action of it. It will affect everything in our life. It will affect our motivations. It'll affect what we allow our minds to think about. It's never been a sin to have an evil thought. The sin on that's, that, that just gets you to the temptation. It's never been a sin to be tempted. Jesus was tempted. Sometimes if, if you've gone through a season of temptation, you feel like a sinner because you've had to fight so many spiritual battles to keep your soul right with the Lord. Keep your attitude and your spirit uplifted in God. But it's not wrong to be tempted. It's only when we yield to temptation. The thought comes in our mind, we can just kick it right on out. It come in one side, tell it to go out the other side. And have victory in our lives. And so Holiness starts on the inside, our motivations, a desire to be pure in our heart, in our mind. We live in a world that's full of temptation. Uh, and I have to say, my opinion, it's far greater than any time ever because there's so many platforms that sin uses to tempt. All of advertising usually has... Uh, 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 an element of lust or sin or wicked thinking in it. Uh, any of the, the things, of course, that Hollywood produces, uh, a, a vast majority of them don't, don't, don't even need to be on any video player we have, any DVD player or any other way you can get it. I'm just saying we've already ruled that out. Why? We want our homes pure. We want our minds pure. We want our attitudes pure. And so the Spirit of God gives us the power to say, no, not coming in this house. And if something fools us, starts out family film, and all of a sudden, boop, it makes the turn like Hollywood likes to do. We got to have the gumption to say that thing goes off. And if it's a DVD, goes in the trash. Not even going to donate it to Goodwill. <laughs> Nobody needs to watch that. Can I get a witness? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
And so it's a wonderful thing to uh, give ourselves to purity. That's the inner part of holiness. It's our conversation, is our lifestyle, our behavior, our conduct. The teachings of Jesus and the rest of the New Testament show us how important our lifestyle is in this world. The Apostle Paul wrote, we are epistles known and read of all men. People are watching you, how you live your life. And we all pray that we will inspire people to righteousness, to going the narrow way, getting on God's highway, walking with him, pleasing him. And so what is holiness? What does it mean? How do we get it working in us? Well, this is your homework assignment for the rest of your life. <laughs> yes, that's what I said. This is your homework assignment for the rest of your life. Because as you move through the scriptures and as you read, and as you meditate on it, it affects how you think, how you speak, how you conduct yourself. It has its effect on us. Thank God it has its wonderful effect on us. We couldn't do it without the help of the Lord and his word. It takes a real effort. But it's something because without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. Sounds like an absolute to me. To me. How about you? And therefore, I don't want to play around with it. I don't want to play fast and loose with it. I want to know and discern what holiness means. You discern it from the Bible, from your pastor, from your godly parents, from God-fearing people in your life messages preaching you've heard and make it in let it make you into who you are and live it out praise god there's a story uh, about an 8 year old king by the name of Josiah his father was king of Judah and he was a very wicked man 55 years he led Judah into idolatry this is uh, somewhere around 700 B.C. in that area, give, a, give or take 100 years. But he was one of the worst kings of Judah. And he just, just the temple was desecrated. He built the high places up in the mountains for idol worship. Baals were all over the place. He went after astrology, all the signs in the heavens, anything that a star out there a million miles, you know, is going to determine what decision you make tomorrow. That's what some people want you to think. They, they'll tell you, they'll, gi they'll give you a little suggestion every day. If you know what star you were born under, I'm asking you, forget it. And understand you were born under the star, the bright and morning star. Yeah. Hallelujah. That's the star we were born under when we repented of our sins and took his name on us in water baptism. Glory to God. And so it's a beautiful thing. But it's, it is a lifetime of dedicating ourselves to knowledge of the scripture, prayer, church attendance, but this king of Israel, his son, Manasseh's son, when he was eight years old, he became king of Judah. Someone had protected him from all the wickedness of his dad, and he immediately began to follow after God. There's no doubt there was a wise, godly priest. There was a godly uh, grandmother of sorts or whoever it was that kept their hand on Josiah. When he was 18, the book of the law was found in the temple. Nobody knew anything about the book of the law. They just heard about it. It was history. And they brought it to Josiah. He studied it, brought it to the attention of all Judea, and led the people into many years of revival. 
all of his time he was king, he kept them close to the Lord. So Esau rejected the call of God in his life. Josiah heard the word of God and opened the door for a great revival. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 6, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Praise God. In Matthew 6, 33, Jesus said, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all of these other things. He's talking about houses, lands, clothes, just all the things we need in life. All these other things shall be added unto you. How do you get them? By seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And his righteousness, of course, is linked just like twin brothers in holiness. And so it's a wonderful thing that we understand it and, and seek to continue to get a better revelation in our life as to what it is. While we trust only the righteousness of Jesus to cover us for salvation. We strive to please the Lord in all areas of our life, in all ways, in all of our words, in all of our thought processes, in our actions, our hearts, our motivations, a lifestyle of holiness because we, we cannot earn our salvation doing good works. But if we have been saved, they will cause us to do good works. They're the evidence of salvation. They will stir us to do good works. And it's important that we put faith in our heart towards Jesus Christ and that we work to do everything right. It is right to try to be good. Some people use grace as a, uh, a license to do anything they want to do. That's a foolish way to go because the flesh, it wants sin. It wants the pleasures of sin. It wants the, the way of, of, of worldliness. Part of it does. But if you keep it down, if you keep it at the cross, if you keep it in the spirit, your flesh will enjoy serving God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Praise God. Aren't you glad you can be happy? In fact, the happiest life is going to be a God-filled life. God's the one that made us, made our souls, made everything in us that makes us happy and joyful. And nobody can fill it like he can fill it. Flee also youthful lusts, follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace, with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. The Bible says, and that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Given to the Lord the glory, do his name, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. The scripture in Hebrews 12, 14, follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. That's not an isolated verse. The holiness of God and the holiness of the believer is all through the scriptures, from Genesis all the way to Revelations. And it's vital that we understand it and give ourselves to seeking the Lord. The inspired scriptures, the Bible, is always, always will be. It is the final authority in doctrines and in lifestyle guiding us. Bible says, and now being made free from sin and becoming servants to God, you have the fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. 2 Corinthians 7, 1, having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God of God. The longer we serve the Lord, the more we, we learn how to please him. We learn how to uh, discipline our flesh. We learn how to say, no, you're not going to say that. You're not going to think those thoughts. The closer you are to Jesus, the more you can tell the devil, no. 
You can tell your flesh no. You can tell the world. I left you a long time ago. You don't have anything I want. You can control. And yes, we are prone to make mistakes from time to time. And there is a solution. We confess our mistake to the Lord. We confess our sin and fall on his mercy. And if you'll confess your sin, he's faithful and just to forgive you. What a gift the gift of conviction is. One of the greatest gifts for a Christian. That's that when that spirit comes on you and lets you know something's wrong. What if you could do all kinds of stuff? Now, we could do that when we lived in the world. We could lie like the devil and just hope we remember what we said tomorrow. But not anymore. If we approach a lie, we're, we got something working on us. If we're tempted to lie, no, you don't want to do that. But as you give yourself over years of walking with Jesus, the beautiful truth of living for the Lord and the peace of the Lord becomes so powerful in your life. And so we learn day by day to walk with the Lord in holiness. Scripture says, and that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. For God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. As we daily read the word of God and meditate on it, we learn to hear the voice of God. Many times it'll be the phrase of a scripture, but it comes to us when we need it. And speak to us and guide us hour by hour. The spirit in our life will encourage, inspire, and comfort us. Through every decade God gives us. In our times of great joy, we will rejoice in the Lord. In our days of great sorrow, we will rejoice in the Lord. When running, we will rejoice. And when trudging long, we just keep on rejoicing. Hallelujah. Let's praise him right now. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We exalt you. We glorify your holy name. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your faithfulness, Lord. Hallelujah. It's a wonderful gift of conviction. I never want to be able to shut it down. I never want to be able to get, get a conscience that's seared, and you don't either because we're planning to make heaven our home. By God's grace, we're all going to be there. There's nothing in this world worth missing heaven for. And that's why we seek to please him. What would you want me to do, Lord? What would, how, how do you want me to approach this situation? And we seek him for wisdom day by day. Romans 8, 1 is a great Scripture, there is therefore now no condemnation, condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. How true it is. Nothing like a clear conscience. Nothing so beautiful as peace in your heart. You lay down your head at night. You got six to eight hours of some sleep, hopefully, and you know that all's clear between you and the Lord. Everything's clear. And you live your days. It's a wonderful thing, you know, looking back over life, that for most of our years, if we started young, for most of our years, we walked with no condemnation because we were quick to repent. We quick to make things right. Quick to hear the convicting voice of the Lord in our life. And all those years, the Lord has been with us and guided us and kept us in his light. I'm so glad he's in this house tonight. And it's raining. I think we need to get Brother Jay, Brett Preston back up here and sing about that rain a little bit before we go. I do have a good report to share with you. But let's stand and praise the Lord for his word tonight. Thank you, Jesus.
We want to please you and walk with you how you want us to walk and live, Father. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Let me mention outward holiness. This whole process of getting the heart right and getting the heart pure and the mind pure, it affects how we live, how we walk in this world, how we treat people. It affects how we love people. It affects how we dress, how we carry ourselves, how we answer, how we walk before the Lord. It affects everything about us. And it, uh, it's a testimony to this world. This church has grew up in a holiness culture. And there are churches, there are some few churches around Charlotte that have that holiness culture in their background. And it's important that we understand that it's a privilege to walk before the Lord in holiness. The churches that have left it, you couldn't tell them hardly anything different from the crowd at the Panthers football game or at the park or anywhere else. And we're not putting them down. We just want everybody to walk before the Lord in the beauty of holiness. And I want to walk that way. And I made up my mind a long time ago, that's how I'm going to walk. And you can make up your mind to walk before the Lord in the beauty of holiness. The modesty, the beauty, the presence of God in our life. Oh, what a privilege to walk with Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We praise you. Let's praise him again. Thank you, Jesus, for calling us into your way, calling us into that place that talks about holiness, that place that will quote the scripture, Lord Jesus. Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. It's our desire to see you, Lord. We want to love everybody. We don't want to be filled with judgment. We don't want to be filled with criticism. We don't want to cause people to stumble with a bad attitude that we could have. Help us to love everybody, we pray, as we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. I feel the rain, I feel the rain, I feel it falling down on me. If you're in the Charlotte, North Carolina area, worship with us at 4929 North Shun Amity Road. For information about service times, church ministries, and so much more, visit us online at firstchurchclt.com. If you would like to support our efforts, text GIVE to 704-445-5353. We pray God's richest blessings to you. Come, worship with us.